Hello there and welcome back. This is part three of our solutions lecture. Marathon, perhaps? Not sure. All right, part three. We're going to talk about collegative properties of solutions. We should get right to it so we can wrap up this chapter. And now, part three of solutions. All right, welcome back. It is chapter 14, part three. Uh, so third and final installment here. This one hopefully shouldn't be too long. We're gonna talk about colligative properties here in this chapter. Uh, last time we got into really important unit of concentration, which is molarity, which is our mold per liter. Remember, you think of this like a formula, you can rearrange it. Uh, liters would be moles divided by molarity and moles would be liters times molarity. Once again, as we talked about all three of these versions of this formula, definitely used a lot throughout chemistry for sure. Uh, that's like a big three if you want to think about it, really coming from just this one equation. Also really important as we talked about, you want to make sure that you are using liters when you use molarity by itself uh, and you do that type of calculation. Also get rid of the big M like we talked about when you're doing calculations, take a dimensional analysis approach so that you can clearly see both of these units. So everything cancels out correctly. You use it like a conversion factor, it could flip it around, use it in the opposite way. But as I talked about a number of times in the last couple of uh, lectures, probably uh, a lot of times, if you do not do that and you leave that big M, uh, most of the time people forget all about the leaders part and get it wrong. So make sure you do that. We also talked about dilution, um, which is M1 V1 equals M2 V2. Uh, and remember that when we do a dilution, the only thing we're adding is more solvent and that will lower the concentration um, because this again is liters of solution. So we're really increasing the bottom part here, which means the overall molarity will go down in a dilution. Uh, this is, again, one of those experiment uh, formulas that you can, as we did a couple examples, leave it in milliliters, but if you want to also convert it to liters here, you can as well. So remember, though, always liters here can use milliliters in this one as long as they are both in milliliters. All right. And lastly, we talked about uh, solution stoichiometry, which like all stoichiometry problems, basically follow those same four steps along the way also we had a limited reagent when we looked at but remember it's sort of step number two here the converting to moles where we do use molarity to do that and that's very common and also remember like we maybe did on that last example there step four where you do have it in moles one of two endings uh this way uh, to get the molarity depending on the information given to you or maybe to get to the volume depending on the information given to you or thirdly like a normal stoichiometry problem like we also did. You could just take uh, moles to grams. So kind of three different endings in solution stoichiometry. I would say a lot of times um, kind of the molarity and liters, I'm sorry, liters ending uh, is kind of the major one, but definitely still a traditional ending there in number four uh, sometimes will happen. All right, so what's on tap for today? A little bit of colligative properties. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of these things. Might not go into great detail, maybe on some, um, but uh, we'll talk about a few of these things to highlight it like it is in this chapter. So before we get there, one more couple types of concentration sort of calculation or units, and this is molality. And molality is actually abbreviated with a lowercase m. And it is moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. And this should not be confused with molarity, which is capital M, which is moles of solute that we talked about last time over liters of solution. So they are different things here. And <clears throat> what ties them together is actually density of solution and so forth actually the thing that can tie them together if you had to go from one to the other uh, just keep that in mind we call it molal um it's sometimes the abbreviation kind of like molar is the molarity abbreviation um so let's take a look at a problem uh calculate the molality 
of a solution prepared by dissolving 61.7 grams of C3A7OH in 175 milliliters of water. A uh, density of water is one gram per milliliter. So uh, let's talk a little bit about this. So molality again would be our moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. So in this particular case, uh, that would be our solute. The water there would be our larger thing, which would be our solvent. So we do need to get moles of it. Uh, so let's we'll start with that. We got to get the C3H7OH. We do have grams. So we do need to go from grams to moles. And once again, that is the molar mass from the periodic table. So we go to periodic table. We have three times 12.01, which is what you would find underneath carbon plus seven times 1.008 which is what you'd find under hydrogen. And uh, actually we could add one more. So uh, we'll do those individually, I guess, since I read them that way. 16 for our oxygen and our one more hydrogen, or we could have just done eight originally there to do that. And if we do all that good stuff, uh, we're looking at uh, three times 12.01 plus uh, seven times 1.008 plus 16 and one more hydrogen thrown in there for good measure going to give us 6009 grams per mole that's what we're going to use to convert our grams into moles so 61.7 grams dividing by our molar mass here 60.09 grams per mole Going to give us uh, 61.7 divided by 60.09. Gives us, uh, we'll call it 1.03 moles. And that's our moles of solute. Our kilograms of solvent is going to be the water. But we actually have not grams of it, but we do have milliliters. We do have the density. So what or what could that be helpful for? Density is mass over volume. So we do have the density. We do have the volume. So right there is what that's helpful for. We can actually calculate the mass of it. Uh, mass would be volume times density. So we'll take that and we'll times this by the density of one gram per milliliter. Those cancel. Gives us 175 grams of water. Remember, though, that that is actually not the right unit that we need. We need it in kilograms. So we got one more conversion to do here. 175 grams of water. There is 1,000 grams in a kilogram. So we'll divide that by 1,000. Move our decimal place a few places over. 0 0.175 kilograms. So that is the bottom part. So now we have everything we need to calculate the molality. Uh, we take the moles up on top, the kilograms on the bottom, and that's going to give us uh, 1.03 divided by 0 0.175. 586 looks like. 5.86. Once again, units do not cancel, kind of like molarity. So you could have two units. R, once again, much like molarity, you can use that little M if you like. And again, it's a little M, not a capital M here for molality. So molality is an important sort of unit. And honestly, it's, it's an important unit for what we're going to talk about here in the rest of this chapter, which is uh, colligative properties. I would say that's probably most cases where you will see molality sort of pop up um, in these sort of colligative properties, as we'll take a look at them here in just a second. Um, but it is, again, a unit uh, that's sometimes used. Along with that, um, another unit is a mole fraction uh, that sometimes pops up with colligative properties. Mole fraction is really like a percentage without the percentage part. So it's sort of calculating the percentage without multiplying by 100. And it gives you really the moles of the uh, each substance that's present in a solution, for example. Uh, so to calculate it, mole fraction is represented by X and whatever you may be calculating the mole fraction of, you would take the moles of whatever you want divided by the total moles. So once again, very much like a percentage, 
except for the whole percentage part. <laughs> so uh, no percentage, no multiplying by 100. It's actually a decimal, uh, which means uh, if you did have 100%, all your mole fractions should equal one, which is basically a hundred percent, right? So if you had say 90% of something and 10% of B, if they weren't in percentages, that would be like 0.9A and 0.1B, which adds up to one total if you got the total mole. So that's sort of the idea there when you don't do it into a percentage, Basically, your 100% is one, so everything should add up to one. So let's see how we uh, could use this. We want to calculate the mole fraction of uh, methyl alcohol, which is this guy, in a solution composed of methyl alcohol and ethanol, or ethyl alcohol, uh, which is this second guy. So we're going to do our mole fraction here of uh, methyl alcohol, which is this guy. That means that we really need the moles here of methyl alcohol or methanol and we need to divide it by the total moles well the good news is the moles of uh, methanol is given to us right there so we have this but we do need to calculate our total moles and in this case we would add them up so 0 0.328 moles plus 0 0.929 moles and that's going to give us a total moles in this case of uh, 0.929 plus 0 0.328 1.257 moles. That means our mole fraction here is uh, 0 0.328 divided by 1.257. So 0 0.328 divided by 1.257. Gonna give us 0 0.261. Basically, that means it's 26% methanol. And the rest of it would be if you actually just subtract one from this number. You get something like 0.739. And that would be the mole fraction of ethanol in this case. You could also have just done ethanol the long way as well. And you would take the moles of the ethanol, which was given to us, and divide it by the total moles. Also should get you there as well. So a couple of ways you could get there. It's basically 74%, 73.9% ethanol. And again, it's not a percentage. So mole fraction also pops up occasionally here in... Um, <clears throat> Colligative properties, especially ones that deal with pressure. And in the next class that you take, uh, you'll probably see it pop up when you actually do like the gas chapter. Uh, in our gas chapter, we really didn't talk about it, but it does pop up there when you do things like partial pressure. Sometimes the mole fraction will pop into there. All right. So these are a couple of things that we will see as we go through these colligative properties here. And let's get into it. Uh, so what are colligative properties? Clear properties of solutions are really uh, sort of dependent on the number of particles that are present. So what do they do? Frankly, when you have a pure solvent, for example, like water, for example, you got just water, a nice pure solvent by itself. When you have something like water, for example, and you want to boil water, when it's just water in there, pretty much, you know, the water molecules have a pretty straight shot out of the solution as you start heating it, and it could go into the gas phase. Let's just say you also had water here, and it was pure water, and you were going to freeze it, you know, put it in the freezer. They also have a pretty clean shot at each other to come together and freeze, for example. So what happens when we start adding anything to water or anything to a solvent, for example? We're adding more particles. And what ultimately in a lot of cases happen, and I'll draw my water or say molecules here as red circles. And let's just say we dissolve some sodium chloride in there. And I'll just draw those as like blue circles all around, right? So 
let's say we, we dissolve a bunch of sodium chloride into this solution with water. And now our water molecules want to boil, for example. So we go to heat this thing to boil. So what happens in this case is uh, not as clear of a pathway now for these kind of guys to kind of get out of the solution, right? There's a lot more junk in the way, if you will. It's going to take a lot more energy, for example, for these guys to try to escape to the gas phase because of all those particles that are present. And as we will see, what will happen to something like its boiling point is it will affect the boiling point. It will actually increase the boiling point. So you have to put a lot more energy in there to kind of compensate for all these additional particles that are floating around in the solution that are not there in a normal uh, just solvent by itself. So when you compare something, for example, like the boiling point of pure water by itself to the boiling point of water when you dissolve something, say like sodium chloride in there, there will be a difference in those two boiling points because the one with the sodium chloride has a lot more particles gets in the way of the natural process of that water being able just to boil. Same thing is true when you would say want to freeze these water molecules and let them come together. Once again, let's just say we dissolve a bunch of sodium chloride in there, right? Again, represented by blue little circles here. Once again, in order for these guys to come together, they now have a lot more kind of things in the way and they kind of have to work their way down. And what happens again in comparison to the solvent by itself with all the additional particles floating around that solution, it makes it a lot harder for it to do. So we will see in terms of its freezing point, for example will actually be different between just water by itself and water that has a bunch of particles parked in there. So the degree of sort of effectiveness or effect on things like boiling point or freezing point has a lot to do with how many particles there are. Uh, so the more particles there are, uh, the greater the effect it will have on things like boiling point or freezing point. So one colleague of the property that's also affected is uh, vapor pressure. So remember that basically the vapor pressure is the pressure caused at, say, the surface of a liquid, right? We always have guys escaping the liquid part into the gas phase. We also have guys coming back down. But at some point, it will reach equilibrium, and we'll have a certain amount of gas molecules above the liquid part. I think we talked about this when we did intermolecular forces. And one of the effects of having additional particles in, say, something like water is, it's going to create a situation where not as many gas water molecules, for example, could escape to the surface. And in that situation, if not many could escape to the surface, we will end up with, if we got something where a lot of things are dissolved in it, we'll have less sort of vapor molecules that have come above the liquid. The result of that is the pressure above the liquid or the vapor pressure will go down. And that's why it's called vapor pressure lowering. There's actually a, a law which is known as Raoult's law. And that is the vapor pressure of a component, like a solution. That is the mole fraction of that component. And that is the vapor pressure of the pure substance, like say water by itself. And we will see that actually the vapor pressure of the solution uh, by itself versus the one where the stuff is dissolved in it will actually be different. So for example, here, if we uh, take now a look at an example of this and we got uh, our PZ is equal to our X uh, Z in our initial here. So we got vapor, what the vapor pressure of ethyl alcohol is 66.5 Tor. Calculate the vapor pressure of ethyl alcohol in a solution that contains 0.2 moles of glucose. So glucose is a molecular compound, so it would dissolve glucose in there. Uh, and it's dissolved in 1.25 moles of the alcohol. So we're looking for the vapor pressure of the alcohol. So that is what we're looking for, which is this guy right here, is equal to our mole fraction of the alcohol. And POZ is like the initial vapor pressure of just the alcohol by itself. 
So the mole fraction here of our alcohol is equal to the moles of the alcohol, which is 1.25 moles, our mole fraction, divided by the total moles, which is our glucose that's dissolved in there, plus our moles of our ethyl alcohol. So uh, doing that right there, that's going to be 0.2 plus 1.25. That's going to give us basically a 1.25 mole divided by 1.45. And that's going to give us a mole fraction of about 86%, 0.862. Remember, it's not a percent. We're not multiplying by 100. So now we have what we need. So our vapor pressure of our alcohol that has this glucose dissolved in it will be 0.862 times the vapor pressure of just the ethyl alcohol by itself. And that's what that means. That's the initial, is what that little circle means, of our vapor pressure in this case, which is TOR. And we will end up with uh, 66.5 times 0.862, about 57.3 TOR. All right, so the demonstration here of this calculation is to demonstrate what is happening here. So when we have, for example, just the ethyl alcohol by itself, nothing else there, enough of these guys can escape the solution that will cause enough of these vapor particles above the liquid to cause a pressure of 66.5 TOR. Now, when we take this ethyl alcohol and we throw some glucose in there and we'll go with our green for glucose or not we've got a bunch of glucose in there what happens again in this situation is less of these guys are going to be able to kind of get up there we're going to have less gas molecules above the surface and that's going to lower our vapor pressure above the surface there to 57.3 so the presence once again of these additional particles are basically disrupting a natural process that ethyl alcohol for example would be able to do and sort of evaporate takes a little bit more effort to do that less of them are able to escape because of those extra particles the result of that is we see less gas molecules above the liquid and the vapor pressure comes down so that's what it means vapor pressure lowering Let's talk about a couple other important sort of colligative properties, and that's freezing point depression. When we add solute to a solvent, it will cause, again, the freezing point of the solvent to actually be lower. It gets in the way of the process of those, say, solvent molecules like water, for example, coming together to freeze. It actually lowers the freezing point. Sometimes people do like rock salt, right, with some ice, lowers the freezing point, gets much colder when it does freeze as well. There's actually a freezing point depression sort of equation. And let's take a look at what this equation really means. We have delta TF. That is not the actual freezing point temperature, but that is the change in freezing point temperature. And that is what the delta means here. Delta means change in freezing point temperature is equal to Kf times M. So the Kf here is the freezing point constant. It is based off of the solvent. So sometimes people will go, I went to the table. We're going to see the table here out of your book in just a second. But I went to the table and I, I can't find like sodium chloride. And the reason you can't find sodium chloride is sodium chloride is the solution, but the solvent, right? Sodium chloride is an ionic compound, which means the solvent is probably water. And that is the value that you want to look up. So when you go to that table, it is based on the solvent, not the solution. M is our molality that we just learned a second ago. That is our moles of solute over kilograms of solvent, right? So that is our molality. Now, because of these particles, the freezing point will actually be lowered. So when we talk about what the change in freezing point temperature is, this is a really important relationship. And I'll tell you why in just a second. It is the temperature of where the solvent would normally freeze minus the temperature of your solution will freeze. And that's the solution that contains 
all the particles that are dissolved in it. So this is really important to make sure that you get sort of the right adjustment of your temperature. And you want to do freezing point this way, solvent minus solution. By the way, water is a very common one that you deal with a lot. Water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. So that would be like what that number would be right there, zero degrees Celsius. So remember though, that if your solvent is not water, you need to make sure that you look up on that table, the correct solvent. So make sure that you do find the correct solvent. So let's take a look at another effect on a property, which is boiling point. The same type of presence of some type of solute uh, those extra particles will get in the way again of the natural way that things boil and it'll actually raise the boiling point temperature. So instead of boiling at this normal temperature with nothing dissolved in it, once you dissolve some of that solute, then the boiling point will actually go up. It has a very similar formula. The change in the boiling point temperature is equal to KB times M. This again is the change in boiling point temperature. This is the boiling point constant. Also, just like the freezing point constant, uh, this is based off the solvent. So once again, if it is water, that is what you want to use. That is our molality, which is our moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. So once again, uh, water, very common one, boils at 100 degrees Celsius, which is normal boiling point. And once again, if it is not water, you want to make sure that you do grab the correct solvent. Now, because here the boiling point is actually elevated, uh, we want to do the change in boiling point temperature as the temperature of the solution minus the temperature of the solvent. So we would actually, in this case, take the solution's temperature minus the temperature of the solvent. And this will again, make sure that you're adding when you should be adding and uh, subtracting when you should be subtracting. Temperature of the solvent, for example, if it was water would be 100 degrees Celsius is what would go there. So here's that table from your book that I was talking about. And again, you can see water, normal freezing point, normal boiling point temperature, and again, our freezing point constant and boiling point constant. Once again, if it's not water, say it's benzene, it has definitely different uh, freezing point, different boiling point, and also different constant. So really important that you go to the table and grab the correct uh, solvent. Remember, you won't find the solution on the table. So let's see how we could do some of these uh, problems here. What is the freezing point of 1.5 molality aqueous ethylene glycol solution? Uh, C2H6O2. That is the freezing point con uh, constant for water. And once again, as we just talked about, water freezes, right? Normally at zero degrees Celsius. So why don't you take a moment and figure out what you come up with here. Okay, uh, let's take a look here. Uh, so we're doing freezing point. So we do want our freezing point uh, formula, which is KF times our molality. In this case, there are nice enough to give us the molality. You sometimes need to calculate the molality yourself, but we do have it. Uh, we would go to our table here and it says aqueous, which means water. And we would go to our table and find the freezing point constant for water, which is 1.86. And again, we would also use this as our normal freezing point of our solvent. So, uh, we could do a little change in freezing point temperature would equal our constant 1.86 degrees Celsius times molality. We're going to times it by our molality here. Those are going to cancel. And that would get us uh, 1.86 times 1.7. Going to give us a change in freezing point temperature of, uh, we'll call it 3.2 degrees Celsius. Now, a really important thing is we're looking for the actual freezing point temperature of this solution. This is not the answer. That is, as it says here, the change in freezing point. So remember that since it's freezing point depression, the freezing point comes down. We would then use our relationship that we talked about where it is the temperature of the solvent minus temperature of the solution because the solution will be a lower number. 
So that means that the change in freezing point is 3.2 degrees Celsius. Our normal water will freeze at zero degrees Celsius minus the temperature of this particular solution. So we're gonna add this to the other side. That will give us the temperature of the solution plus 3.2 degrees Celsius equals zero degrees Celsius. We're gonna then, uh, I guess I should put the plus in there. I did put the plus, I guess, there, there. We're gonna subtract the 3.2 to the other side. And that will give us the temperature of this solution will actually be minus 3.2 degrees Celsius. That is how we get the negative there. It needs to be there because if you think this was your answer, your temperature and your freezing point actually went up, right? Zero to 3.2 is actually going up, but it's freezing point depression should be going down and that's why it is the negative here so this relationship is really important when you do these type of formulas that you actually do solvent minus the solution when you're doing freezing remember for boiling it's actually opposite of that um, so that's really important sort of relationship by the way ethylene glycol antifreeze for example you might be familiar with in your car uh, typically you use antifreeze in your car uh, for two things, it actually will lower the freezing point temperature. So if you happen to live in a really cold environment, it will allow the water and everything in your car to freeze at a much lower temperature, which is good if you live in a really cold environment so it doesn't freeze. And it actually elevates the boiling point of water and stuff in your car. And that's also good if you live in a really hot environment so that your car doesn't overboil. So antifreeze actually does both of those things, which is what this is right here. Uh, it will actually increase the boiling point and actually decrease the freezing point. And that's very helpful for a car, especially if you happen to live in very extreme sort of environments, uh, really cold or really hot. It will hopefully prevent your car from overheating or freezing, uh, both of which you do not want to happen, obviously, with your car. Let's take a look at another one here. We want to calculate the molar mass of a compound. Uh, if a solution of 12 grams is dissolved in 80 grams of water and it freezes at a temperature of minus 1.94 degrees Celsius. So let's take a look at this one together here and see what we should be thinking about. Well, first off, we're looking for molar mass. So we just want to think about the units of molar mass uh, and that is units of grams per mole. So we wanna see if we have any information that's gonna be helpful to us. So we have a solution that has 12 grams dissolved. So if I'm not mistaken, that's grams and that's grams. So essentially I have the top part of my molar mass that I need. So I do have some freezing point information here. I got me uh, the mass of my solvent. And I also have, uh, which is 80 grams. I also have the freezing point of this solution is minus 1.94 degrees Celsius. So I feel like my freezing point equation might be good here. KF and M. Well, I have the uh, KF given to me. This is actually the freezing point of the solution, not this guy. So once again, the change in freezing point is temperature of the solvent minus the temperature of the solution. And we know that the solvent here is water. So we know that it will freeze at zero degrees normally. So we do know that the change in freezing point would equal zero degrees Celsius minus where this solution will freeze, which is minus nine, 1.94 degrees Celsius. This whole thing is done because those two minuses will turn my change in freezing point temperature into 1.94 degrees Celsius, which is actually a positive number. So now I actually have this number. So what I don't have is the molality, but I can solve for it. And we'll see why that's important here in just a second. The molality will be our change in freezing point temperature divided by our KF. Putting in our numbers, uh, 1.94 degrees Celsius 
divided by our Kf that we get from the table because it's water. And again, when this uh, kind of flips around, the degrees Celsius will cancel out. The molality will come to the top and we will end up with 1.94 divided by 1.86. Gonna give us a 1.04 little m. All right, so I bet you're wondering, <laughs> what does that do for me? Well, remember that we could get rid of the little m just like we get rid of it with molarity. And that's going to mean that that really is moles per kilogram of solvent. And that's moles of solute, right? Per kilogram of solvent. So why is that helpful? If I think about the molar mass, I'm missing moles. And lo and behold, right there is my moles. It's just popped into there. So how do I get rid of the kilograms of solvent? Well, right there is my mass of the solvent that was given to me. It is not in the right units though, right? I need it in kilograms. So we're gonna do our 1000 grams as a kilogram, and that will give us 0 0.080 kilograms. Now I could take that and multiply it by 0 0.0800 kilograms. Kilograms will cancel, and that's gonna give me moles. So uh, one, 1.04 times 0 0.08, going to give me 0 0.0832 moles. And that is the bottom number that I need. So using my freezing point information, it allowed me to get to the molality and using the units of molality, which is moles per kilogram of solvent and the mass of the solvent that allowed me to get to the moles. So to finish up this problem, I'll take my molar mass is going to be grams divided by moles. Grams is given to me in the problem of 12. Using freezing point uh, information, we got our moles of 0 0.0832. And we're just going to divide those two out. 12 divided by 0 0.0832 gives us about, and we'll call it 144 grams per mole which is our molar mass of this information. So in addition to using freezing point depression sort of equation, our boiling point elevation equation, just to figure out freezing points and boiling point temperatures, uh, we can actually use it here, like we see here, to figure out something like the molar mass of a compound. All right, so why don't you give this one a try, a little boiling point action happening here. How many grams of ethylene glycol? Uh, must be added to one kilogram of water to make a solution that boils at 105 degrees Celsius. Uh, some information be helpful. Carbon 12.01, I think. Hydrogen 1.008. And oxygen 16. All right. Uh, take a few moments and see what you come up with here. Okay, yeah, uh, let's take a look here. This one is actually boiling point. So we have a little bit different of a formula, kind of very similar. Uh, KB times M is the only difference really is the boiling point constant. Uh, we're adding it to water, which is our solvent. So that is why we went here. We're also dealing with boiling point. So remember, we're looking at 100 degrees Celsius is where water normally boils, right? So uh, we have a solution that boils at 105 degrees. Uh, we have our KB. We could actually get to molality here, uh, which is our moles per kilogram. We do have our solvent, which means we could then get to moles. And from moles, we could get to grams of the C2H6O2. So that's sort of our pathway where we're going. Before we do that, we do need the actual change in boiling point temperature. Remember that that's actually where the solution will boil not to change so this again is where we have that relationship of the change in the boiling point temperature is the temperature of the solution minus the temperature of the pure solvent by itself so in this particular case our change in boiling point temperature would be our solution which is 105 degrees celsius minus where water would normally boil which is 100 degrees celsius it is only a five degree change, which is really important here. So what happens now is we have our change of freezing point. We have that. We could solve for our molality, which would be our change in boiling point temperature divided by our KB. 
putting in our numbers of five degrees Celsius divided by what we found on the table of 0.12, 5.12, our 0.512 degrees Celsius molality. Once again, our degrees Celsius will cancel, molality will come to the top, and we'll take uh, five divided by 0.512, gonna give us 9.77, we'll call it. Again, that is molality, which is moles per kilogram of solvent. Once again, we have our solvent given to us in kilograms. So we just need to times it by one kilogram. Means that the kilograms will cancel and we'll end up with 9.77 moles of our solute, which is our C28602. Obviously at this point, it is a moles to gram. So that's the molar mass that we need here. So adding all this up, uh, we got two times 12.01 grams per mole plus six times 1.008 grams per mole plus two times 16 grams per mole. All right, so uh, two times 12.01 plus uh, six times 1.008 plus uh, 32, basically. 6207. It's the molar mass of C2H6O2. All right, then uh, we'll do a little bit of that there as our last conversion here to get to our grams. So 6207 grams per mole C2H6O2 times 9.77, about 606 grams of this guy would be needed there. That's a 6.02. So once again here, using our boiling point information to use the molality to go from moles to grams. All right, last one here, a little bit on boiling is, um, calculate the boiling point of a solution made by dissolving one gram of glycerin in 54 grams of water. Uh, once again here, carbon 12.01, hydrogen 1.008, and oxygen 16. All right, take a few moments to see what you come up with here. We're actually looking for the boiling point in degrees Celsius. Of a solution made by dissolving this uh, glycerin in 54.0 grams of water. Okay, uh, let's take a look. Boiling point. So we'll pull out our boiling point equation, which is our KB times our M. All right, so uh, we have our KB for water, which is our solvent in this case. And we also know since we're doing our boiling point here, we want to do for our solvent, which is water. And that's 100 degrees Celsius where it normally will boil. Obviously, it's going to boil differently here because we're adding some stuff to that water. So we need to figure out a couple of things. We have the KB. Uh, we actually need to figure out the molality in this case. Uh, so we do have our solvent, which is our water. And that was uh, 54 grams. Remember to use it for molality. It needs to be in kilograms. So... That's a thousand grams and a kilogram. So we'll do that conversion while we got it here. Looks something like this. We also need moles, right? So we will need the molar mass of this guy. So that's going to be three times 12.01 plus uh, eight times 1.008 and three times 16 here. All right, uh, three times 12.01 uh, plus eight times 1.008 and a little three times 16 action there. 9209 sounds like a good one. 9209 grams per mole here is our molar mass of C3H803 from the periodic table. We're using that because ultimately we're looking for the molality here, which is our moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. So 
Uh, we don't have the moles of our solute, but we do have the gram. So one gram of C3H8O3 using the molar mass we just calculated there. Uh, we're going to put the grams on the bottom so they cancel. So one divided by 92.09 in this case. 0 0.0109 moles of our solute. And now we got everything we need. Uh, we have, I think, our kilogram solvent. We have our moles of solute. So we can find our molality here of 0 0.0109 moles divided by 0 0.0540 kilograms. gives us 0 0.201 moles per kilogram. That again is not the answer, but kind of the missing piece that we needed for our boiling point equation. So now that we have that, we can go into our boiling point equation. We'll do this in our KB from the table. And what we just figured out our molality here moles per kilogram which is molality will cancel and that will give us our degrees celsius which in this case will be 0 0.10 degrees celsius now that is not the boiling point temperature that is that is as it says here the change in the boiling point temperature so remember that it's boiling point elevation. So we want to use the correct relationship, which is our temperature of our solution should actually boil at a higher temperature than our solvent. So we know it's 0.1 degrees Celsius are change. Temperature of our solution is what we're looking for. Minus 100 degrees Celsius, which is our normal boiling point. We're going to add this to the other side. That's going to cancel. That's going to give us the temperature of this solution will actually equal 100.10 degrees Celsius. That's a whopping change. Not really. So basically here, uh, we just did uh, raise the boiling point temperature by 0.1 degrees Celsius. So the presence of this one gram of glycerin uh, we'll raise our boiling point temperature by 1, 0.1 degrees Celsius. All right. Let us talk then about one more thing about both of these things, freezing point depression and uh, boiling point uh, elevation. Up until this point, the solute that we used is uh, non-ionic which means when it dissolves in the solution or the solvent, uh, it will really only create one particle. Now, if you use an ionic solute, you would actually have more than one particle when you dissolve it. So let's say we did throw sodium chloride in there, for example. When sodium chloride goes into water, it will break up into a sodium ion and a chloride ion. That is basically for every one particle we put in there, we get two particles out. So that is sometimes referred to as the von Hoff factor. And that's what it's sometimes referred to as I. And I in this case would equal two. And the two is one particle, two particles. So basically when I put that in there, I get two particles floating around. Now, if I took something like calcium chloride, for example, and I throw that in the solution. I will have a calcium ion and I will have two chloride ions. The von Hoff factor or I would equal three in this case. Basically, I would have a calcium ion right for every one I put in there and a couple of these guys floating around. Now, because colligative properties are based on the number of particles that are present, actually, when you do ionic solutes, it has a different effect on your boiling point and freezing point, for example. 
when we do non-ionic things like all the stuff we just did ethylene glycol all those guys with carbons hydrogen oxygens they are sharing electrons they're molecularly bonded covalently bonded when you dissolve something like that like ethylene glycol you get just one particle that like you put in there you get one so really the von Hoff factor is one and is why it's not included in the formula we could take both the freezing point formula and include this in with it and also the boiling point formula and include that in with it as well so this is what is sometimes referred to as the von Hoff factor and this is the version of those equations whenever you're dissolving any type of ionic solute that will create more than one particle so what is the difference between it let's just say for example uh, we'll do our freezing and boiling point we'll use our water and we'll use our water example for both of them so let's just take uh I guess we'll just make up a number. So we have our uh, KF, which is 1.86. Our normal freezing point for water, which is zero degrees Celsius. And our KB, which was uh, 0 0.512 degrees Celsius per molality. And our normal boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius. So let's just see, for example, <clears throat> how that might affect and would there be a difference so let's say we had the exact same for sodium chloride let's say we had a 1.2 molality solution and we also had for calcium chloride the same 1.2 molality solution all right so these are both aqueous solutions. Once again, water being our solvent for both. Let's do our freezing point for our sodium chloride here. So we know I is equal to two, as we just saw there. Get two particles for every one of those guys to go in. So that's going to be two times our KF of 1.86 degrees Celsius molality. And we'll use our made up molality here. And if we do that for our sodium chloride, we will have two times 1.86 times 1.2. Give us a change in freezing point temperature of 4.46 degrees Celsius. We're gonna do the same thing here for our calcium chloride and figure out its freezing point. So the change in its freezing point would be I KFM. So I for it will be three, KF will be the same. And we use the same molality in this made up example. Will give us uh, three times 1.86 times 1.2, gonna give us about six point, uh, it's actually like about 6.7 degrees Celsius. So these are not where this temperature is gonna normally freeze. But just for comparison, if you did the actual freezing point temperature for the sodium chloride, it would freeze at minus 0.4, minus 4.46 degrees Celsius. If you did it for the calcium chloride, it actually freeze at minus 6.7 degrees Celsius. So having that one extra particle floating around in there that is not there actually lowers our freezing point even more because we have more particles in the way causing it to take longer to freeze and has to remove more energy to let it freeze what happens with the boiling point in each of these cases so if we took the boiling point for sodium chloride once again i is two boiling point constant 0.512 we'll use our same molality that we made up and that will get us uh two times 0.512 and times 1.2 can give us about 1.23 degrees celsius we're going to do it for our calcium chloride and again i for this guy is going to be three We'll do uh, 0 0.512 degrees Celsius molality and our 1.2 here. 
So uh, 3 times 0.512 and times 1.2, 1.84. So once again, we see that with that extra particles present, we actually see that the calcium chloride will actually boil at a higher temperature. Uh, so in this case, 101.23 degrees Celsius for our sodium chloride and about 101.84 degrees Celsius. Once again, the presence of the extra ions and particles floating around causes an even greater increase. So when you're dealing with ionic compounds, you actually do have to take them into consideration with that I or the von Hoff factor. And it's basically just equal to how many particles the ion breaks into, ionic compound breaks into. If it breaks into three particles, you use I as three, it breaks into four, four, and so forth. But the greater the amount of particles, uh, the greater the uh, change in uh, temperature you would have. Up or down, depending on what you're measuring. We won't calculate it here, but uh, you know this is also why, for example, sometimes people will put salt into their, say, water if they're boiling uh, their water there for making pasta. Sometimes people think they're doing that to help it maybe increase the boiling point of it, so it boils hotter, and so it then cooks your pasta quicker. And the reality is, for example, if you did sort of the calculation, give or take. Um, you know, if you wanted to uh, raise the boiling point, you know, maybe like, I don't know, one degree Celsius or something like that, maybe two. Uh, I think the calculation is something like uh, you need to put in there uh, over a pound of salt, uh, which most people don't do that when they throw it in there, right, for their water to salt their water. It's kind of throw a couple of little pinches of salt in there. Uh, so really what you're doing when you're doing that is most likely helping the flavor of your cooking. It actually will change your boiling point a little bit, but based on the amount of water you typically have when you boil, save noodles, uh, you would have to put a ton, 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 ton of salt in there to uh, increase the boiling point of that water enough to make a significant difference in the overall temperature. Uh, so again, when you do that, you know, you're probably just really doing it for seasoning uh, rather than trying to increase the boiling point so it boils hotter and stuff like that. I, uh, we won't do the calculation here, but I've done it before and it's something like over a pound of salt and it will only really raise your overall boiling point, like maybe one degree Celsius and stuff like that. So um, that's a lot of salt, by the way. Most people don't put anywhere near that amount of salt uh, when they kind of season their water when they are making pasta. All right, real life application there. All right, let's talk about a couple other properties of solution, osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure is uh, the pressure uh, that occurs by the separation of a solvent from a solution by a semipyramidal membrane. Um, so, for example, if you had a column and it had a membrane here, and a semipyramidal membrane, as we'll talk about in just a second, it's really a membrane that has holes in it. And allow certain size molecules to go through and bigger guys get kind of stuck and they can't go through. So on one side, for example, you have say salt water, which is more concentrated than the left-hand side, which is just say pure water. And the process of osmosis, as we'll talk about, is a process where solvent molecules like water will move from one side of a membrane to the other in an effort to dilute it down. So from a less concentrated side to a more concentrated side. So in this case, because water has nothing dissolved in it, it's not very concentrated, but it will move towards the salt water that has salt dissolved in it. So water will flow in this direction and it will continue to flow till it hits a pressure equal to our, the atmospheric pressure that is sort of coming down on it. Uh, and it will hit you know, the atmospheric pressure coming down. And that's what is known as osmotic pressure. And what will happen at that point, it will stop the flow of basically water molecules across that membrane. Uh, you can actually calculate the osmotic pressure. And this is the symbol for osmotic pressure. And I put this up here because uh, it is actually something we've done before. It is the ideal gas law, basically is what it is. And basically, if you take P is equal to NRT divided by V, 
remember that when you take n over v that is moles over liters which is molarity and then you times it by rt so that's how we get to this guy uh, so this guy right here and this guy is moles per liter which is the molarity times rt uh, so we're not going to really calculate osmotic pressure or anything like that even though you could because it frankly is just the ideal gas law uh, like we talked about in the gas chapter so by the way when you would use this you would want to make sure everything is in the correct units once you get a reminder of pressure needs to be in atmospheres volume needs to be in liters n is moles r is the gas constant 0 0.08206 and temperature needs being kelvin talk a little bit about the semi uh, pyramidal membrane again as i mentioned it is really you can't see it but there are holes or channels in the membrane and once again allow small things to pass through uh, larger things once again too big to pass through like our membranes in our body or membranes or semi pyramidal membranes that certain things to filter in or filter out colloids by example are larger than solute particles in solution there are large molecules like groups of uh, molecules or proteins or ions they're homogeneous which means they look the same throughout they do not separate out they're small enough to pass through a filter but too large to pass through a membrane uh, so if you want to filter them for example with a funnel badly drawn funnel there you put some filter paper in there they will go through the filter paper uh, but they will not go through a membrane like a dialysis bag suspensions on their hand are heterogeneous uh, non-uniform mixtures which are usually things that you can see with the naked eye they're really too large to go through a filter or a membrane uh, so they get dropped by both basically um, so colloids could go through uh, solution particles could go through a filter uh, but uh, suspensions get caught suspensions uh, and colloids get caught in a membrane like a dialysis bag so if you had a dialysis bag uh, those two guys would not come out of the bag it'd be trapped in there but small like solvent particles or solution particles can go in and out of the bag here's an example of um, a semi-pyramidal membrane once again uh, allowing certain solutions to uh, pass through as you can see there's kind of holes and as you see these small water molecules no problem coming through uh, but these larger sugar molecules are going to have a little trouble kind of crossing through that membrane here's an example of that again uh, settling out is going to be our suspensions you can see them with your naked eye our solution and colloids will filter through filter paper once again suspension is getting caught up there in the filter paper and this is like a membrane or a dialysis sort of bag that allow only those smaller solution guys to pass through so as i mentioned before osmosis is that flow of solvent molecules from a lower concentration to a higher concentration always moves in whichever way will sort of dilute down that more concentrated one again it will continue to flow until it hits that osmotic pressure and it will stop that flow so once again if we had our example like we did before with our membrane right there and our salt water on this side and our pure water on this side once again it's going to flow this way in an effort to dilute it until it hits that osmotic pressure what is reverse osmosis you may have heard about reverse osmosis is where you apply for example a greater pressure than your osmotic pressure what that's going to do actually is going to turn everybody around in terms of the water molecules and it's going to cause all the water molecules to start heading back in this direction and if you have a really good filter membrane there it will trap everything else on the right hand side and on the left hand side you will basically have pure water it'll trap everything that can't go through let just the water molecules pass through and again by applying that external pressure greater than the osmotic pressure you can kind of push all the water molecules back the other way and sort of purify the osmotic pressure is based on the number of particles that are dissolved in there so uh, water has no osmotic pressure because if it's just pure water it actually uh, has nothing dissolved in it 
Another sort of measurement of osmotic pressure is what is sometimes referred to as osmolarity. And that is I times the molarity. I is that von Hoff factor, what we just started talking about. So just to again, show you the difference in terms of the osmotic pressure with something dissolved in there versus something not dissolved. Let's say we had a 1.5 molar solution of sugar, which is non-ionic. So I would equal one, you get one particle per dissolving. Uh, we say we had 1.5 molar of our sodium chloride, whereas we talked about I would equal two. You have a sodium ion and chloride ion, which is two ions. And we'll do 1.5 molar of our calcium chloride, where I would equal three, as we've been talking about, which is one calcium ion and two chloride ions. So if we were to calculate the osmolarity of each of these solutions, starting with the sugar, we would end up with basically one times 1.5, and that would give us what is known as 1.5 osmolarity, and that's sort of like the osmotic pressure. Now, if we did the same thing here for our sodium chloride, I is equal to two, so that'll be two times 1.5 molar. That's gonna give us three osmolarity. Already we can see by twice as much particles in there, we have like twice the osmotic pressure sort of happening in a sense. And if we did something like calcium chloride, I would equal three times our 1.5 molar. And that's gonna be 4.5 osmolarity. And once again, we also see pressure go jumping up from here where we only had two and even more where we have three versus uh, one uh, we have three times the pressure so again this illustrates these calculations here to illustrate that as the number of particles that are present in the solution has a big effect on these colligative properties like osmotic pressure for example um, the more particles that you have the higher the osmotic pressure also again if you have just pure water like we talked about a second ago and see uh, no osmotic pressure as there's basically nothing dissolved in it. Let's talk about a few other ways to describe solutions, and that's isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic solutions. Isotonic solutions exert the same osmotic pressure as body fluids, and that's what most IV bags are. And why is that important? Well, let's take the classic example of a red blood cell. If you put that in an isotonic solution, you're gonna have flow in and out of the red blood cell that's gonna be equal to each other, which means it's gonna be happy, nothing bad's gonna happen, which is why IVs are isotonic because uh, if you're getting an IV, you may not be in great shape and you don't wanna do anything that's gonna cause you even more problem because our cells act as membranes, right? So. We want nice equal pressure in and outside of the cells and that's gonna keep the cells really healthy. So what are considered isotonic solutions? Well, isotonic solutions is considered 0.9% by mass, the volume of sodium chloride, sometimes referred to as a saline solution, some type of ionic solution. R, it is 5% glucose sugar solution. So those are considered isotonic solutions. So anything above or below that is not isotonic. It will either be hypotonic. Hypo means less than, and that means it's lower than. So it'll be lower than those two numbers. That's why those two numbers are important to remember. So make sure you know those numbers. So you have something to compare everybody to. Uh, if you put a red blood cell in a hypotonic solution, you take this red blood cell, and this is in a hypotonic solution. That means outside of the cell here is less concentrated than inside the cell. Osmosis means it goes from lower concentration to higher concentration. So everything's gonna rush into the cell. The result of that, the cell is gonna start to swell and burst, which is known as hemolysis. That's probably not good either. And that's gonna be cause bad things to happen. What happens if you put it in a hypertonic solution? So if you take your red blood cell You put it in a hypertonic solution. That means outside the cell is actually more concentrated than inside the cell. So what's gonna happen is your cell's gonna go, uh-oh, 
let me just drop out all my solution into the surrounding solution and in an effort to dilute it down the result of that is your cell is going to start to shrink and go through creation also not so good uh so again the red blood cell for example acting like a membrane and obviously allowing certain things to go in and out through osmosis and the difference in pressure osmotic pressure say within the cell outside the cell and within the cell is going to cause that osmosis perhaps to go one way or the other so let's take a look here uh, so here's some examples uh, we have an isotonic solution everything looks good uh, in the center we have a hypertonic solution water leaves and it starts to shrink and over here we have a nice swelling of the cell uh, as everything rushes in in a hypotonic solution all right so let's just think about this what would happen will it shrink will it swell will it be okay if I put a red blood cell in the following solutions, I put it in a 1.1% sodium chloride solution. I put it in a 3% glucose solution. I put it in a 0.9% sodium chloride solution, and I put it in a wa pure water. All right, so take a moment and decide in each of these cases, will it shrink? Will it swell? Will it be okay? We'll go through creonation. We'll go through um, hemolysis. I can't spit that out there. <laughs> we'll go through hemolysis or creonation. All right, so take a moment and see what will happen in this case. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so before we do this, we need to know about isotonic as we just talked about. So once again, 0.9% sodium chloride or saline solution. 5% glucose, basically. So those are our standards to compare to. So here we go, 1.1% sodium chloride is as simple as 1.1% is greater than, which means this is a hypertonic solution. Hypertonic solution means, once again, that outside of the cell is more concentrated than inside the cell. That's gonna cause everybody to rush out of the cell and that's gonna cause it to shrink and go through crenation, about 3% glucose. So once again, 5% is isotonic, 3% is less than, which means that is hypotonic. That means in this case, your red blood cell is going to actually absorb all the liquid from the outside as it rushes in through osmosis, going to cause your guide to swell and go through hemolysis about 0.9% glucose. That looks like a winner, actually. I'm sorry, 0.9% uh, sodium chloride. That looks like a winner. That's gonna be isotonic in this case, right? And that means that your red blood cell is gonna be okay because inside and outside, same osmotic pressure, nice even flow in and out of the cell. How about pure water? Well, if you put isotonic because it's water, you're in bad shape because water, as we just talked about, has no osmotic pressure, which means in this case, pure water, not a great thing because it's actually a hypotonic solution. That's gonna cause outside the cell to be less concentrated than inside the cell. And that's gonna cause everything to rush in and we're gonna get that swelling that's going to happen in this case. So this would be a case where water, although it's normally safe, not safe in this situation, because it actually will cause water to flow into the cell and start to swell in this particular case. All right, so once again, 0.9%, 5% glucose, 0.9% sodium chloride or a saline solution. Those are important numbers to know. Lastly here, dialysis. Process similar to osmosis allows uh, small solute molecules and ions, as well as solvent molecules uh, to pass through, but retains those large ones, so colloids. Uh, dialysis, for example, in our body is done to basically filter out uh, things that waste products that we don't need. Uh, in the laboratory, sometimes dialysis bags are used to uh, sort of uh, 
equalize, say, whatever you're working with with a certain environment. So, for example, if you're working on some proteins or something like that, you could throw those proteins, for example, to a dialysis bag like this. You could put it into a solution that has a specific pH and let it sit there. Maybe like a pH that like you would find in the body. And then now you have your proteins in the exact same, say, pH environment like it would be in the body. And you could do your experiments a little bit more realistically. Uh, this is like a dialysis bag. Again, it has small holes, allows certain size molecules to pass out and pass through. Other ones are too large to get out and it gets trapped in there. All right, I think that is chapter 14. Only one more to go, I think, after this one. So that's good. Uh, so thank you for watching this one. And we'll see you, I guess, on the last chapter lectures. Have a good one. See you in a bit. Bye-bye. Hello, and I hope you've enjoyed the conclusion of our solutions lecture. I'm going to tell you a joke. Oh, let me think. I can't seem to remember the joke. That chemistry joke, what was it? Ah, uh, I don't know, but it's on the tip of my tungsten. <laughs>